you came in with a problem, your problem's a branch, there's really root rod involved in it. I want to look at that root rod, what it is, because it feeds the branches. You're made body, soul, and spirit, born dead to God in the spirit. The first thing that's caused is to be self-centered. Uh, self-centeredness has you looking to things outside of you to meet your deepest needs and you become religious. You become, uh, you try to fill the vacuum in something other than Christ or other than God and you can't, your appetite for those things just go, go up. You're also, the second thing that's wrong is you're um, insane because you're out of touch with reality. You don't judge your thoughts and you don't judge your, your emotions. That causes the obsessions. The third thing is you don't know who you are. You got an impression you want to leave a, a room full of people, but what do you feel at your worst? Nobody would like you at your worst, so you cover it up. How did you get those feelings about who you are at your worst? In your self-centered, insane condition, other self-centered, insane people told you who you were. Now you're controlled by your image. You're always protecting it, trying to change it, and people can control you. They can move you in any direction. One of the biggest identity messages you probably got had to do with relationships and performance-based acceptance. You keep working and working to get acceptance, you can't, and finally you'll just jump off. You said you had a problem, but really there was an event that caused the problem, and the only reason the event bothered you is because of your past. It pushed your button. What if I could give you a new life so the event didn't bother you, you wouldn't have the problem, you wouldn't have to be angry and upset. See how your past affects you when you look uh, at anxiety? Some people are at 50%, some are at five, and then a 5% event for one person is a 20% event for another. Idols are something that we trust because we're born dead to God and the spirits, and aren't we self-centered and insane, controlling identity? We try to find something we can trust. Rachel and Leah saw God work, but they still took their idols with them. Just like the God works in, in patterns, you have the Old Testament temple, the Holy of Holies, the holy place, the outer court. Uh, our spirit is where he dwells, but we have to live out of the power of the soul. I want to look at, the, uh, at another aspect of your self-life, your, your uh, inner life, and that has to do with idolatry. You had hurts, you learned how to cope, they don't help you. Now you've got symptoms. You'll never mature as long as you're, as long as you're coping. God is taking you to the end of those idols by putting you in situations you can't handle with the idols. We release everything to him. It's not just us dragging our problems around or holding our problems while he carries us, but letting him take us. Now, why don't we let God do all of that then? Why don't we look to him to meet our needs? Because in our mind we run to him and our emotions we run away. I've got a little test to look at your emotional concept of God. You have needs, you'd never let that God meet him, but God is love. And the only way you'll make that shift is faith, but faith isn't making the love, faith is receiving his love. <laughs> okay. Now, I don't want to be irritating going over it and over it and over it. Okay. But I want you to be comfortable with the material, begin to see the flow, get it at 10%. And my fear is, in training is always that you would abandon your uniqueness for another's. And I just don't see that. We minister with people. We're in a with ministry. And it's very important to me that your uniqueness is expressed in this. So we're only giving you what you need to see where we're going and then your uniqueness to come in. And uh, so when you get done, you'll really be able to say this is your material. I told the pastors in uh, Costa Rica that all came from villages, I will be in the village your village because you know I like villages and when I get there the people better not know who I am I don't want people to know who I am when I get there because buy the truth and sell it not if you see this diagram and it's your revelation it's yours don't quote Mike you want to tell a story tell the story I mean this, it's your revelation you got it and, and Ray and I and the rest of us in the ministry we don't operate that way we just say, look, everything's out here in a bucket. Come and get what you want and use it. Because the lesser gives way to the greater, and the greater is him. And so we want you to have your uniqueness. OK, again, I want you just to listen to what I'm saying and tell me what you get out of it. Because I want you to build out of your own revelation what you hear and what you see, page 78. We've been talking about the self-life. What makes up self-life? 
quickly. It's in your head. You just start shouting it out. Idols. Idols. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Insanity. Okay. So we're starting to understand what our self life is. Now, it's very important as we're understanding the self that we're going to take up the cross and deny and have definition for you. Do you know that there's a self you can't deny? And if you try to deny the self that cannot be denied, you're going to be in trouble. It's very, very confusing because people say you should crucify yourself. Well, if I give you three nails and a hammer, you'll just end up looking stupid. You're not going to get yourself crucified, are you? <laughs> and so crucifying yourself is kind of a ridiculous thing. Uh, he has to crucify you. Then you need to deny yourself. Well, if self is so bad that you crucify it and so bad that you deny it, what in the world is Jesus talking about when he says you need to love yourself? And so what we're looking at are three expressions of self. There is a self that's crucified, a self that's denied, but there's also a self that's loved. And one of the biggest complaints that uh, psychologists have against Christian counseling is that they accuse us of killing a person's uniqueness. You have a uniqueness that you're born with. You're unique. There's nobody else like you. God's not in the cookie-cutting business. He's made each of you differently. And as we said before, he, he uh, breathed His Spirit into you. You're made out of the dust of the earth and you became a living soul and in your soul is your mind and your will and your emotions. The soul is the seat of your personality and your uniqueness. So there's no way to express who you are without mind, will, and emotions. And even somebody who's lost all of their limbs can express who they are through mind, will, and emotions. So the soul is the seed of the personality. Some people live primarily in their minds and we call them thinkers. And then some people live primarily in their emotions and we call them feelers. And some live primarily in their will and we call those people doers. Why is personality important to me? Because you can have one behavior and that one behavior can have two different motives. So let's take the behavior of being quiet. For a thinker to be quiet, what are they doing? Thinking. For a feeler to be quiet, what are they doing? Pouting. Yeah, they're pouting. Sounds like malicious truth. <laughs> So feelers are pouting. Now, when you look at a person then, we're always dealing with their behavior, we think. But we actually deal with the motive we perceive behind the behavior. And so when you're quiet, I don't know what's going on. So we're different people. We're created differently. We perceive things differently. When we're talking about discipling people, we have to disciple them from their shoes. It doesn't do any good to disciple you from my shoes. And so if I'm talking to a thinker, they would like to know analytically how this thing say about personality really works out in the family and in the marriage and in their own life and how do you see that. The feeler will start to feel guilty because he's judged people wrongly. And I've got to pull alongside of him and say, come on, let's go. The doer's sitting there listening to it and say, I got a new sales technique. I know how I can abuse people. If I can figure out their personality, I can tailor things to their personality and I can sell to them. But it's important to see that everyone is different and God isn't getting you to abandon your uniqueness. You live in a constant state of contrast where people are standing in front of you in a church and spiritually defining what normal is and what's normal. Them. Whatever they are is normal. If they know Greek, that's spiritual. That's a task for a thinker. If they're an evangelist and they've been in the middle of wars and that kind of thing, they're doers. That's not spirituality. And the same thing with the feeler, that um, your emotions are moved and they're very emotional and all that. That's not spirituality. You confuse that. 
You can have overpowering personalities in the thinker and the feeler and the doer and you come away feeling inferior because you don't measure up to them. I was sharing, you know, that last year uh, when we were in Mississippi doing training and Don uh, Arterburn that does, does training with us, a psychologist from Texas Tech. Uh, Lubbock. Yeah, Lubbock, Lubbock, Texas Tech. Well, he got up after about uh, four or five days of people listening to Ray's lectures and he said, I want to introduce all of you to a phrase. I'm not Ray and that's okay. I'm not Ray and that's okay. Would everyone please say it for me? I'm not Ray and that's okay. <laughs> and he said, I want you to see that because you have an overpowering personality that is defining spirituality for you. Now, Ray would no way come in here and tell you that he wants all of you to be like him. But you can't help but sit here in the presence of a powerful personality and not get a standard and get the bar raised and get a definition of spirituality. And so we all have to be careful that we're not doing that kind of thing. And, when it's, not, and it's not in our heart to do it. And some people it is in their heart to do it. Are you comfortable with the way God has made you and comfortable with your expression? What is so important for me in this training, again, is that you maintain your own expression of this message through your personality. I want you to grab the message. I don't want you to grab a personality. You with me? And I want it to be fresh through your personality, expressed in a new way in your situation. You're the best person where you're at because you're the one at that place. You are different. Have you ever thought about your differences? that God made you a certain way. And then the next question is, do you really love the way God made you? Do you enjoy the way He's made you? Or are all the things around you telling you're inferior and something's wrong? Do you like the way God made you? It's so fun when you see somebody who's content with who they are and how God has made them. Now He's put them together. So we've been talking about the self-life that's going to be denied and understanding it and turning to the Lord. But there's a self you can't deny. God made you out of the dust of the earth. He breathed His Spirit and you became a living soul. It's the seed of your personality. People can live mainly in their mind or in their feeler, in their doers. Everyone's a blend of that. But it's important to understand because I want you to attach the right motive to a behavior. I want you to minister to people from their own shoes. And I want you to be the unique expression of God and not let someone else determine your spirituality by their personality. Can you be happy with who you are? Okay, write down a sentence what we just said. <clears throat> what did you hear out of it? You don't have to get it all. What did you hear? In that lecture, what touches you? What's, what's important? You're going to be killed in 30 minutes and you get to speak to a group of people on their uniqueness. What would you tell them in two sentences? What would you want them to know and take with them? <clears throat> All right, Sherry, what do you got there? <clears throat> you are made with a unique personality and God wants you to enjoy the way he made you. Great. Yep. Okay, Kent. This Christ expresses himself uniquely through me. Uh-huh. So in that statement, right away we're talking to a person, we're saying we're not asking you to be like somebody else. Mm -hmm. No one's ever thought about this, really, because we're always driving for a standard that others set. So what we've said here is there's a self you can't deny. There's a self you need to love. Uh, God made you out of the dust of the earth. He breathed his spirit. You became a living soul, mind, will, and emotion. So there's three types of basic people, thinkers, feelers, and doers. Let me explain that another way. Look at your body and your body is divided into three parts. And so you have the muscle and the more muscle you have the more you can get what you want. All you've got to do is follow this diagram. The muscle is like a doer. What does muscle do? It gets what it wants. So the more doer you have, the more muscle you have, the more you can get your own way. Feelers are given to the senses taste, touch, sight, and sound, and it puts you in touch with the world outside of you. Do thinkers are like the perfectionist organs, the heart, the lungs, and the brain, and they're dedicated to a task. Why do they all react differently? Why do they look at things differently? Because God made them differently. 
That's the whole point. And I want you to come up with your own illustrations and you can find plenty of them. Um, God made me out of the dust of the earth. He breathed the spirit and I became a living soul with mind, will, and emotions. It's the seat of my personality and my uniqueness. Have you ever thought that God made you uniquely you? That you respond to things differently? An illustration is the body. You can just look at your own body. The more muscle you have, the more you're a doer. Uh, the feelers given to the senses. The thinkers given to perfectionist things. Now let me give you a couple examples of that. No personality is better than another personality. Everybody gets 10 whole units. And so yours might have come in mind, yours might have come in will, and yours might have come in emotion. But you still have 10 units. Each of these personalities have their own little world that they excel in. So, if you're a doer in the school system, and you in your mind have one unit, and the thinker has eight, who's going to do better? The thinker's going to do better in their own world. And all of these personalities develop their own world. And so you have the guy who's the doer who likes risk-taking, and he's got eight in the area of risk-taking for doer. Is he going to do better in his world than the thinker? And so we can't compete in these worlds. I'm not in that world. And uh, again, people have blends of personalities, but you have the feeler, that's the person you're going to see on TV, the life of the party, all those kind of things. The thinker can't compete with that, and the doer can be bothered by it. And it's funny how we always minimize the others, because doers like to call, oh, they're just perfectionists. You know, they're just perfectionists. Well, they're minimizing. You know, perfectionism doesn't matter because I couldn't do it if I had to. Well, and then the doer's going in for brain surgery, and they go, hey, we finally found a guy that's not a perfectionist. He's a doer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's going to go in through your heel and fix your brain. So, but, you know, I mean, you have to appreciate each one of these. Do you appreciate, and, and we're starting to build that, do you appreciate people that are thinkers, that are feelers, that are doers? The thinker looks at the feeler and says, oh, you're just a people pleaser. That's all you are, just people pleasing. That's all you care about is people pleasing. Well, okay, man, go get your own food. You know, cook your own today. Everybody can just cook their own. I don't care about people. I don't care if people are happy or not or comfortable. You go to a people pleaser's house, and I'll tell you what, you'll be comfortable. And I'm not saying any of these things are good or bad. It's, it's who's in rule of it, who's, who's in charge of those things. And so we all have our, have our different world. God made me unique in my soul. It's like the body, doers, thinkers, and feelers. And nobody's better than the other person. You just have 10 units, period. And that, that's where you're at. Now, I want you to hear this part. We just built on this. Tell me what you hear out of this. It's confusing when you say crucify self, deny self, and love self. So here I've put yourself with your talent, ability, intellect, and interest in the middle of this circle. Now, when the old man or the old life rules over that, I don't care how good it looks to you, it's going to express flesh. You're going to live in hell and go to hell and just express flesh all the way along. If you have Christ in you, but you still allow the old life, your self-life, which we've defined now, is your self-centeredness, your insanity, your identity, your idols, and your unbelief. If you allow those things to rule over your uniqueness, it's still going to express flesh, and it might express the exact same flesh. This person is going to go to heaven, but they live in hell. So we have our, if you look at the Apostle Paul, he was a driven man here, wasn't he? God created him to be driven. Under the rule of self, he expressed flesh, which was to kill Christians. Under the rule of the Spirit, he never stopped being a driven man, but he expressed the Spirit and would give his life to see people saved. And when he was under the rule of his self that we're to deny every day, 
he was doing things like this. Get rid of John Mark because he's a no-hoper. <laughs> Just get rid of him. He's holding us up. And Barnabas, and if you remember, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Paul. He did not say, set apart Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas was the greater. And it's Paul in his own writing that shifts the order. Like a typical doer. So all of a sudden, Barnabas is supposed to be at the top of the brochure. <laughs> <laughs> And Paul's down here, but all, all of a sudden Barnabas gets the brochure and Paul's up here and Barnabas is down here. He, he shifted the order. And when the self-life is in charge of my uniqueness, and we know what our self-life is because we've given definition now. So when it's in charge of that, it's still going to express flesh. And so Paul says, no, no, John Mark's a hassle. Get rid of him. Don't have anything to do with him. And Barnabas says, hey, hang on. You know, we can work with him. And Paul says, then you go too. And, and so the same thing, he, he's killing people here in the flesh and he's killing their spirits here. And here he's giving his life and building up spirits. And so we can shift from all of these. We were born with this life, Adam life in charge. It's crucified and when I receive a new life, I can still shut that life off and let self rule over it and express flesh. Playing the piano is not a spiritual gift. It's a talent. And there's a difference between talent and spiritual gifts. And so you have someone who played the piano for a rock and roll band and now it's for a Christian band. Well, they're expressing something different here. But that's a talent, that's not a gift. So you have talent and abilities and intellect and your own uniqueness and it needs to be under the rule of the Spirit. So what is the self that I crucify? It's this old uh, Adam life. It's crucified and replaced with his life. But even though the old man's dead, the baggage remains. My mind didn't go blank. I can shut off his life. Position's different. Condition becomes the same. I let self rule over this, and I'm still going to express flesh. Be careful when you look at people's flesh. It doesn't mean they're not a Christian. It can just mean that the door's closed. And then the goal is, of course, in abiding in the recognition of Christ, which is what abiding is. How do I abide? I recognize I am abiding. Once you do that, you're abiding. Abiding is recognizing I am. That he's, un he's my life, and as he flows under that, he'll express it. How do you tell when you go from over here, the expression of the flesh, the expression of the spirit, is you lose your peace. We'll say it over and over again. It's not what you do, but why you do it. You stand and fall on your why, not your what. And so the thing is, is that under the flesh, I might be people-pleasing, and really just expressing my flesh to try to get my self-centered needs met. And so I'm doing something for people. Now I'm abiding and I'm still doing something for people, but I'm doing this as an expression of Christ in me. They might not know the difference, but I know the difference in the peace of God. Now you know what a lot of people will tell you, this is just stop serving because you're people pleasing. Well that's not my point. Go back and look at the source of the thing. What's going on at the source? Get the source right. I'm not telling you to quit doing it. Because we always go to, uh, the enemy is the enemy of extremes. If he can't get you hoarding gold, he'll have you melting your wedding ring and giving it away. He doesn't care where you're at as long as you're in an extreme. And the enemy loves extremes. And so, and so you get this with, well, you're only taking the lecture. You're only speaking to people for your own glory. Well, no, I'm not. In the peace of God, you know when this is off. And we shift between these, between these two all the time. And the expression down here can be here. The real fruit of the expression is what's going on up here in my heart. And do I lose my peace? What is the self you crucify? What's the self you deny? And what's the self you love? In our lectures so far, we've talked about the old life and how it develops. When it rules over your personality, it's flesh. I don't care how good you think it is. It's still flesh. It'd be good flesh, good, bad flesh, whatever. It's flesh. Now Christ becomes your, your life, but if you shut him off, you've got the veil up, and even though the Spirit's in the Holy of Holies, you've got a veil there that you've stitched up and you're, and you're keeping him hidden, then you're still now using your talent building intellect to live the Christian life and to appear to be Christian. But it's an expression of flesh, it's not spiritual. 
And now we go back. See, we're using the same diagrams over and over and over again. We flow back and then they repeat. That's why in our lectures you can drop any three sections and still do the lectures. You'll still get to the point. In fact, you can probably drop all but one of them. You can get it done. In, in this one, I could probably go wherever I wanted to go with it. And so now I'm abiding. I have Christ in the real. I have the peace of God in what I'm doing. Doing the same thing, but I have peace. And it's an expression of him, not an expression of me. Okay, give me a little sentence on that. Key? I'll just put uh, one unique self will manifest the flesh if my old life is all baggage or in control. It will express spirit if I'm abiding. The old man has been crucified. The baggage needs to be denied. Okay. Yep. And you notice in all of you, none of you have said you need to kill this because you can't. It's your uniqueness and your expression. You can't kill it. This lecture is actually one of the easier ones that you're going to be doing because from basically, other than explaining at the beginning that you're unique and you're made different, you just follow the diagram and read them. So it's pretty straightforward to go through and you can add to that later, but it's, it's one of the easier lectures because I say here, God made me out of the dust of the earth, breathed the spirit, I became a living soul, mind, will, and emotions. It's the seed of my personality. Your personality then is made up of being a thinker, a feeler, or a doer combinations. And so I want to explain that to you because maybe you never thought of it before. Your uniqueness. Doers are muscles. The more, the uh, more muscle you have, the more you get your own way. You know people like that. You know feelers. And you know thinkers. And let me give you some examples about that. We're not asking, uh, well, everybody gets the same amount of units, so there's no partiality with God. We all get that. We're not asking you to lose your uniqueness. But what we're saying is this, that when the old man rules over, it's going to express flesh no matter how good it looks. False holiness is believing the opposite of bad behavior is good. False holiness, imitated holiness, is believing that the opposite of bad behavior is holiness. The opposite of bad is just good. It's not holy. And that's a fake holiness. That's not real holiness. And in holiness teaching, all you're always being taught in holiness teaching that the opposite of whatever they define as bad would be holy. Well, it's not true. The opposite of bad is good. It's not holy. The only thing that is holy is Christ coming through you, a holy life. And so it doesn't matter if the old man, what it's expressing through the personality, good or bad, it's not holy, it's flesh. And then if you allow your life to be ruled over your lying emotions, your lying thoughts, your self-centeredness, your idolatry, and your unbelief, I don't care what you're producing, it's still not holiness, it's flesh. The very best will be flesh. And now, if Christ were to rule over that, I could express Him actually Christ being expressed through me. So we do that one, and now the rest of these, you just read. Here's some of the differences between thinkers, feelers, and doers. You're just reading the diagram and going through it. The reason the diagram is a triangle is because thinkers are focused, feelers are very wide, and doers stand in the middle with a plan, but they want to use people. A thinker can operate by, uh, on a task by themselves. Feelers like to be with people, but a doer always has a task that needs people. So he's in the middle. And so what we have there then is that you just go through here and read what describes the thinker, feeler, and doer. You've already been doing it, so you're just going to do it in another way. Just read the diagram, go through there and say, here's thinkers. Um, and you can add whatever you want to that are the most significant thing about a thinker for you. You go to the next diagram, here's how you see the world. A thinker is more passive, so we put that there. They live at the bottom, a doer lives at the top. We'll look at the doers in our life and ask them to drop down and get closer to us. A three floor improvement is big for a doer, but it's not much for the person sitting, st standing down here. And the doer will call down to the thinker and say, would you please make quicker decisions and be more active? 
And so they try to go faster and give you an answer in three days instead of 30. And they've really done a good job now, but the doer doesn't see it as anything happening. And what we do is, is we just don't get in other people's shoes. Uh, people are really trying to improve and we're not letting them. We're discouraging their improvement because whatever they do isn't enough for us. And instead of saying that's really what I liked in you because incompatibility is a grounds for oneness, two circles that are identical as halves do not fit together. It's only circles that are opposite that fit. And so in the body of Christ and in our marriages and in our relationships, we need opposites, but we stop appreciating them because we don't see the differences in people and we don't see there's a need. God must have seen a need just in the way that He made the body and how He made us. And then finally we just say, have you ever thought that energy levels were different? The energy level is pretty simple. Energy levels start high and low. And we're just saying the thinker's is high and ends low. The feeler starts low and ends high. And they try to relate to each other. I took Betty to Hawaii and I went flat out for three days and then I had to take a nap because I was exhausted and I couldn't find her and she was down at the pool reading and I said, what are you doing reading? Put that book away. We got to keep moving. We can't waste a minute. We got on the plane. She said, I'm so glad this holiday's over. <laughs> well, it's not a holiday because you're going flat out the whole time. And so energy levels make a difference in the way we see people. Why push the thinker beyond what they can do? At 8 o'clock at night, the pumpkin rolls up, they get in it and go off to bed. I mean, they're gone. And so to just keep pushing them isn't right. And, and understanding those differences does a lot. The whole point in the lecture is just to understand differences, to see that we're different. Doers start out high, they go flat out, and they fall into bed at night, exhausted. Okay? Now, we're going to go practice this and go through it. I'll go back. We can, you can quit it. I'll just start. See where I'm going and see if you just see the flow. And tell me, just, I'll just ask for anybody to comment. Tell me something when we get done. God made you out of the dust of the earth. He breathed the Spirit in. You became a living creature with mind, will, and emotions. It's the seed of your personality. Some people are thinkers. They're obsessive people. If you stare at them, you know you're married to one because they're looking straight ahead. If there's any pause, they're in the playground in their head. You've got feelers. They're, they're very, very emotional. You hurt them very easily. Then you've got doers. They're driven people. You get their attention best with a board. Have you ever thought that God actually made you that way, that it's not a flaw in your life? And you can look at the body and see it because in the body it has three parts. It's not all muscle. It's not all feeling and it's not all thinking. So you have muscle, you can get what you need. You need your muscles. You need your mind to tell you where to go with your muscles. You need your feelers so you don't hit somebody with your muscles. So you need all of that. Everybody's created differently and there's no special people. God gives you 10 units. And I don't want you to be feeling inferior because you're comparing yourself in the thinker category when you're a doer or you're a feeler and you're comparing yourself to a thinker. Everybody gets 10 units, period. That's the way it is. He doesn't show partiality, and we're different. We never kill our uniqueness, and you can't kill it. Stop trying to be somebody else. You can express Christ uniquely through you in your unique way. You can have the old life expressing it, and that's flesh, good or bad. You can have Christ, but not deny self and let self rule over it. That's flesh. Or you can have Christ rule over it. I want you to see that people are different. You don't lose your uniqueness. Thinkers, are, t are, are, are their, their lives are focused. Task equals identity, all those things. A doer has to have a plan done with people. Let a doer tell you his big plan and then yawn and he'll go off beam. Because he's got to have you to do it. He hasn't planned on doing it. He just needs you to do it. Then you got feelers and relationship equals identity with them. Are you starting to see the differences in people? Once you see those differences, do you love it, do you encourage it, or do you discourage it? And so a lot of us have been in places where you're a feeler and it's not acceptable to me as a doer, so I'm going to crush you and keep yelling at you to become a doer. One poor woman, her husband, he'd ask her a question and she's a thinker and it'd take her about three minutes to get it out and he's yelling the whole time. 
you know, and just, just screaming at her to get the answer. And of course, then she starts having stress and panicking and all those kind of things. The doer says, stop being passive. Well, you try, but it's never enough. In the same way, the thinker can say, slow down, and you try, and it's never enough. But seeing those differences, we have different energy levels, too. One starts out high and ends up low. If you're a thinker, take lunch away. Go, get away from yourself. If you're a thinker in this group this week, I'm telling you, you need some time to walk a time to go into your room and close the door. When people knock on the door, don't act like you're there. Just hide. <laughs> because not only is the teaching draining, the people are draining. It drains your energy. And uh, so your energy drops off. If you're a feeler, the last thing you're going to be able to do is to go crawl into bed at 9.30 tonight and just sit there and stare up at the ceiling. There's no television. There's no activity. What am I going to go do? I've got to go find somebody. Well, go find a feeler and have a good time. Yeah, you make a party. <laughs> but, but we're different in that. Do you accept your differences? Do you see your differences? We're not trying to kill your differences. We're trying to minister into them. All right, you see the flow of that? It's a really simple lecture. Follow the diagrams. Explain the key points we went over. Get your own analogies. It makes a huge difference for people to start to see this. They've never thought of it. They've just seen their wife wasn't like them and she must be defective instead of seeing what she really brings into the relationship. And of course, I hate it when people, again, are confusing their personality with spirituality mm -hmm. and somebody else's expression of Christ through them unique and then them having to have that. You can't do that. And, you know, I hope you're getting the point here we're not doing that. Because Betty will agree that we only need one mic.